We continue in 2 Samuel 5 today as our writer and the narrator give us a list of all the things that David has done to consolidate the legitimacy of his royal reign in these chapters from 2 Samuel 5 to 10, as you can see laid out on the right side of the screen. So if you haven't watched the introductory video to this unit, I really encourage you to do so where I go over some of the issues of, of when and at what level are we reading this. Is it pro-David or anti-David? Is it pro-monarchy or anti-monarchy? Is it consistent with other parts or inconsistent? So if you're uh, interested in those questions, I encourage you to watch the introductory video. We've so far gone over these first three elements, and now we're on this one here. And as you can see, without studying it on the left side of the screen here, this passage here from 18 to 25, um, it's it's plainly not a story of a battle or some historical incident where the Philistines are threatening. Uh, it's laid out just sort of like the um, description of David taking the stronghold of Zion earlier in the chapter, where as we looked at that up closely in this scene here, it wasn't clear if there was a battle or if the Jebusites just gave up, but it was so sparsely reported, even though there were doublets in it, that it left us wondering what's be really being narrated. And similarly here, although we can see 18 to 22 as a tight little chiasm, as you can see here on the screen, framed around the Philistines spreading out in the Valley of Rephraim, Rephraim excuse me, um, we can also see it as a parallel panels here where there are two reports that are very similar and that's what's being presented here. So we can see this part which otherwise fits the chiasm here as the introduction to this parallel story and you can see how parallel they are. The difference is simply that Yahweh gives different advice in the second one and David follows it. Um, so I, I hope what you can see here as we go through this, this is really not about David's prowess uh, or even a military situation. It's about David inquiring of Yahweh and Yahweh listening to David and responding as opposed to what we saw with Saul. And so that's really the point of this whole unit is to show that David has divine legitimacy and that he's not just um, a gang leader who's taken power, but Yahweh is on his side. So in terms of key words, we're in our section here, and plainly the Philistines are a key word here throughout, and they appear out of nowhere, as we'll look at when we look at the story. Another word that's key in this section, although I didn't lay it out because it's not a key word in the chapter here, is um, parrots, to burst out, and you can see it's in a name here twice, and it's twice in a verb and a noun here, so four times in this one verse, as we'll see uh, right here in verse 20. Um, in terms of what's going on, the Philistines had come and spread out in the Valley of Rephim. And the word for spread out, as we can see here from the root Natish here, is again in 22, as we can see there. But it's recalling what we saw in 1 Samuel 30, 16. Let's go back to that and we can see the context. Um, where um, the, David's opponents, the Amalekites here, were spread out all over the ground, eating, drinking, and dancing, enjoying the spoil. And David attacked them, and it describes how many escaped, and he recovered the spoil and his wives. Um, so that does not suggest a battle stance. That suggests they're just laid out in the valley, perhaps uh, feasting, perhaps taking a break, but not that they're prepared for battle, or not that they're threatening David and Jerusalem in any way whatsoever. If we look at the location described as the Bal Valley of Rephim in both situations, we see that's right here, uh, just to the south uh, west of, of Jerusalem down here in this valley. And this is Philistine territory back here. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, the description of the second um, battle here is that David defeated them from Giza, or perhaps it's um, from Giza, I'm sorry, from Gibba, which is probably Gibeon here to Giza here. So this territory that's between the land of where the Philistines are and Jerusalem is what's known as the Shephala and the valley here away from the coast and also away from the mountains. Um, but the new RSV over translates it to suggest that there really is a battle here. And I want to highlight that the key thing is David inquiring of Yahweh, not any supposed battle that's taking place here. So let's leave the shape of it up as we go through our passage. Um, the word for Rephim it's described here as the plain of Elbaqua, southwest of Jerusalem, as I showed there. It's only mentioned once previously as describing a boundary allotment. Uh, but in Deuteronomy, um, we can hear it a couple of times. And I'm going to highlight here in Deuteronomy 2.20, we can see how it's associated with Titans. So we see here, also usually reckoned as the land of Rephim, formerly inhabited, the Rephim formerly inhabited, though the Ammonites called them um, Zamzumin, a strong and numerous people as tall as the Anakim. And we see that again in the earlier one in 211, like the Anakim, they're usually reckoned as Rephim. But it's the other one in, from 220 that highlights that the Anakim are understood as tall people. And that's what the spies saw when they went out into the land and saw these tall people. Uh, but they're not there anymore. Um, they were described as, as gone. And so we can see that the root word here can, can mean giants, but can also mean ghosts. And so both issues are at stake. There's no 
no, there's no tall people there, but perhaps the ghosts of those who'd been there in the past. But what, what the narrator accomplishes by mentioning Rahim and, and both times, Rephaim rather, I'm sorry, uh, both times, is a reminder of David and Goliath. Uh, that David first gained fame and, and power by being chosen to take on the giant of the Philistines. So we're being reminded of David's whole journey from, the Philist, from Goliath and with the Philistines back in 1 Samuel 17 up to now. So as we begin to look at this and we see only here in this scene and in 2 Samuel 8 do we hear of David fighting Philistines and only one other time in chapter 21 do we hear David inquiring of Yahweh. So this is really a performance piece put into these chapters by the, the writer to just highlight this list of checkoffs, basically, that we can say David has uh, accomplished everything necessary to claim divine authority. And they're really fairly colorless scenes here, other than this great description of bursting out. So let's look at it more closely. Uh, the word for inquired, as we've seen earlier, is, is Sha'al. So he sawed, and he won't saw all after this, but that highlights not only that he's not invoking the name of his uh, previous enemy who's now dead, but that he's not going to continue to be in the very relationship that this particular passage is holding up as an example of David's faithfulness and of why he should be recognized as Yahweh's uh, selected king. Um, he'll do it here, but he won't do it elsewhere. So this will maybe resonate in our minds and we'll assume he does it elsewhere, but when we read closely, we can't. And this is what we know. I'm making this video uh, right in the midst of the 2024 political campaign in the United States, and maybe by the time you're watching it, we know the result of that. But highlighting the short campaign of Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, uh, commentators are mainly saying their main issue is to define themselves for an audience that doesn't know them. And perhaps that's what's going on here, that David needs to be defined um, and so that we, 3,000 years later, know the great King David precisely because of passages like these that have accomplished their purpose of establishing David in this relationship with Yahweh before he goes into battle. Um, but as I'm suggesting, it's um, our conclusion is drawing more inference from it than the text actually says. So we ask the yes or no question, which usually implies the kind of, um, whether it's a lot or picking stones, um, that imp um, implies a passive relationship with Yahweh, that there's not an act of what we might call prayer relationship and actual engagement with Yahweh, um, as we saw, in, as we'll see in chapter 7, when David gives a speech to Yahweh and Yahweh gives a speech back, first through Nathan and then directly to David around the question of the temple. But here this is suggesting the more mechanical um, devices, except the second one is not, as we'll see. So shall I go up and will you give them in my hand? And the answer can certainly be yes to both. Yes, go up, I will give them into your hand. So we don't have to infer that the answer is this long phrase. It could just simply be a yes, but we don't know that since we're obviously not there. Certainly give highlights at give as, as double there for emphasis, a common Hebrew practice as we've seen throughout. So I will give, yes, give the Philistines into your hand. And it's highlighting both that David is asking and that Yahweh is on his side, even though there's no particular reason to attack the Philistines here as far as we can see. They're spread out in the valley, but they're not coming up to Jerusalem. There don't seem to be any kind of threat to Israel or Judah. Uh, and yet, so this is just a test of David's relationship with Yahweh, or as I was suggesting, a demonstration for the reading audience. Um, as Graham Old notes, this is the last time we'll hear of of uh, Yahweh putting someone into their enemy's hand here. And although it says I'll put them in their hand, just a few verses later, the attack repeats itself, as we can see on the right side of the screen. So they're not too much into David's hands, are they? So we hear the uh, effect here, as Halper notes, Immediately after he became king of Israel, the text claims, David broke explicitly with his former former masters. The effect has been among readers since the writing of the Apology, which is to say um, the entire um, Davidic succession and Solomon's succession story, to exculpate him from the charge of collaboration with the Philistines in the war on Saul's house, the Civil War. And we'll see the similar effect in chapter 21. So that's recalling the fact that the last time we saw it, uh, the Philistines was when David was working for them and the lords of the Philistines were threatened by his going to war with them and so uh, his friend the Philistine king Ashish uh, pushed David away because of the pressure of the lords. And But the last we'd seen David is working for the Philistines and so in addition to d the text demonstrating that he's in relationship with Yahweh, it's demonstrating that he can treat the Philistines as an enemy. So he came to Baal Perazim, um, uh, a location that we don't know, although it's an interesting etymology. Um, 
uh, Falkman uh, finds a need to protect David's Yahwistic worship in, in the face of a Baal here, or at least um, the people's relationship, by suggesting that Baal was used in early Israel as a name for the God of Sinai. And that's certainly true, but we don't have to protect the Israelites from anything here. The text is what it is, and sometimes David and sometimes the people are portrayed as less than faithful. The very request for a king, as we saw, was deemed in Yahweh's own voice as an abandonment of Yahweh ruling over them as king over them. So he came to this place of Baal, or some god, bursting out. And we see it's four times in the verse. Here is a verb, here is a noun, and then the place name again. And note that the narrator tells us the place name before the event that allegedly is the impetus for the place name. Um, and as we were noting in the story of this uh, taking the stronghold of Zion earlier in the chapter, the timeline is certainly confused here. We saw with the children uh, just a few verses earlier that those uh, births of children certainly represent the entire reign of David and not just something that's happening this immediate moment. And so perhaps that's the case here as well, that it's recognizing that it has that name at the time of the writer, but it got that name because of um, the Lord bursting forth. Defeated is certainly over-translating the basic word nachak here in the hiffel form, which simply means smote or hit in one way or another. Um, as my note below has, uh, it indicates the ambiguity of the degree of engagement. It could mean as little as David turned them back after they're seeking to know if he was with them or against them. Um, and note there's no booty or body count other than the abandonment of icons parallel to the role of the ark in 1 Samuel 4-6. to And I realize now I, I'd skip through verse 17, which establishes they'd heard that. So I should go uh, back to that and, and highlight that there. The Philistines heard, just as King Hiram of, of Tyre had heard that David had been made king, and they went up in search of him, which should not be difficult because he's there in Jerusalem and it's not that big a place at this point. He's only beginning to build it up after he's taken it from the Jebusites. But he heard about it and he went down to the stronghold, so to the place of Zion, which is his hiding point. So that's the context that I left out before we started. So now he's uh, come to this place and it says he defeated him, as I was noting, but it simply means he struck them in some way. And then he said, and... And this is a very interesting thing because it really has little to do with what we've heard so far and there's no particular reason to think we really need to know the origin of the name Baal Perazim. But here it is. It says, Yahweh has burst forth against my enemies before me like a bursting flood. Um, one word here, parrots here. Uh, and what is that telling us? Why do we need to hear that emphasis four times? As we'll see, that's echoing what we'll see in 6.8, the bursting out around uh, the issue of moving the ark around. And so what we're seeing already in chapter 5, we'll see it in chapter 6, and it'll really reach its fruition in chapter 7, is that Yahweh is free. Um, yes, David can inquire about Yahweh's will, and he can get Yahweh's answer and then do it, but Yahweh is free. Um, David can do what David's doing, and Yahweh is going to do what Yahweh is doing. Yahweh is not subject to David's control. Um, and as much as every king throughout history would like to have their God in their control, if they're really a God, they're not in their control. And certainly Yahweh, in the understanding um, and throughout uh, the books of Samuel and throughout the larger Bible, especially the texts that we know are available to our audience, not the, necessarily the post-exilic texts, would understand Yahweh as their only God and the powerful God. Um, so Yahweh can burst out, and we'll see that bursting out again. So then we see the outcome here, um, and notice the echo of the original scene in 1 Samuel 4. Let's look at that there. The Philistines fought, Israel is defeated, and they fled. So this was the backside where the Philistines defeated Israel because they have no king or leader, and the ark was captured. So really our story is taking us all the way from 1 Samuel 4 up to 2 Samuel 6 to highlight um, the um, divine nature of having David to protect them from the Philistines and to house the ark, as we'll see in Jerusalem momentarily. Um, so it says they abandoned their idols there. Using an unusual situation here, using the word atzeb, translated here as idols, and we saw it earlier uh, around the booty in 1 Samuel 31 9. That's the second reference back there. With the spreading out was the other one. It's translated elsewhere as images with the Hebrew galul as idol paired with it, as at Jeremiah 50. Uh, Falkelman notes here their location at the end, which is, say, the Isles at the end of the story, is ironic. We learn of the gods only after the defeat of their worshippers has supplied proof of their impotence. Um, we don't hear if this is Dagon, um, the god that we saw uh, that the Ark uh, decapitated back in 1 Samuel 6. This is just simply generically saying they abandoned whatever statues they had that they thought would protect them in battle. 
and David and his men carried them away, which is actually very suspicious. Why not destroy them? Why are they taking them? The, um, the, the um, revisionist narrative in First Chronicles corrects this and says that they did destroy them, embarrassed by the idea that Philistine idols are in the hands of um, Israelites like David and his men. But that's often the case that Chronicles softens and makes more pious David than the raw text we see here. And so, whether this is the end of the chiasm or a second scene, it happens again. And it's interesting in terms of narrative, it really makes little sense. If the Philistines abandoned their idols and David had attacked them there, why would they go back to the same place and do the same thing? But again, this is not meant to have us think historically, uh, but to think symbolically about the power of David here. And so you can see the different response here. When David inquired, you get a, gets a long response. And this long response, the second half of verse 23 and all of verse 24, uh, leads Falkelman and others to note this can't just be the yes or no answer because uh, we don't hear what he inquired. We didn't hear, as we saw last time, should I go up, the yes or no question. It just simply says he inquired, and the answer is, you shall not go up. Go around to their rear and come upon them up, um, opposite the balsam trees. When you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then be on the alert, for then Yahweh has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. Notice, allegedly, Yahweh speaking of Yahweh's self in the third person here. There's no first person voice here at all. What about this here, the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees? At least Falkelman and others suggest the sound of the heavenly host, Yahweh Sabaoth, the heavenly armies coming to the rescue. And although we won't see them, uh, what else could be the sound in the tops of the balsam trees? Um, the word for marching here, se'ara, is only in Isaiah 3.20 elsewhere, and it's not clear from the translation um, that it would mean marching. Um, we see it one other time in 6.13, and we can see that there, um, who simply as bearing, not as, as marching. So you can hear this, just simply hear the sound of them in the tops of the balsam trees. Then be on alert. And notice how it's highlighting Yahweh is going to strike them down. It's not that you're doing it, it's that Yahweh is doing it, even though the narrator says he struck down the Philistines. Um, and so it, it's suggesting the combination here that Yahweh is doing it and David is following up. But if David hadn't struck them down, would it have been necessary? Or was Yahweh doing it directly? And of course, what does that even mean that Yahweh struck them down? What would Yahweh do apart from David bursting out in some way that we can't imagine? Is this like taking on the Egyptians in the Exodus story where the natural elements uh, would be at the hands of the Creator against the enemy, the gnats and the frogs and the water of the Reed Sea itself? But we don't hear any more than we heard the details in the taking of uh, the stronghold of Zion earlier in the chapter. And so none of those details are important. What's important is David did just as Yahweh commanded them, struck them all the way um, from Geba all the way to Gezer, uh, as we saw here, pushing them back into Philistine territory. And that's all the narrator really wants us to see about that. And now we're going to get into a much longer story with some humor in it, too, about the recovery of the ark parallel to the story that we saw exactly in the same place in 1 Samuel 6. See you for that next time. Bye-bye.